Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, campus minister at the University of Toledo. When we look at our own society, I mean, we find so many things aren't really free. Even our current president who talks a lot about the free market, then we find uh, proposals like, well, uh, paying farmers not to produce uh, particular products. We find industries subsidized in various ways and so on. So I, d I don't think we really have a totally free market, do we? Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Dr. Thomas Klein, Professor of Marketing at the University of Toledo. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of the capitalistic system, an analysis and critique. Here's Father Basic. Tom, I want to thank you for coming and uh, taking time out of a busy schedule and coming to speak with me on this program. You and I have one thing in common now. We're both at the University of Toledo. And what is it exactly that you do there at that university? Well, Jim, I'm a professor of marketing, and I teach... Uh, both undergraduate and graduate courses to uh, students in the uh, College of Business. And recently I've gotten involved in a program of curriculum development in the area of the humanities. We're trying to see if we can't bring a better way of uh, educating business students in the humanities than we have in the past. That's been a matter of uh, really a shift in emphasis from the traditional kind of you take your English and your history and so forth in the first year or two and then you take your areas of specialization in, in uh, business. Well that kind of background uh, Tom I think will uh, put us in a good position to do some talking about the topic I want to speak about because it, is, it has to do with our the whole economic system here in the United States the capitalistic system and I I want to use some ideas from a book that both you and I have looked at at one time or another, and that is Michael Novak's The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, a book that's gotten big play. I saw it written up in the Wall Street Journal, among other places, and very controversial book in, in many ways. And I want to talk a bit about um, some of his major ideas and, and get your responses to those from the, uh, out of the perspective of your own discipline. And, I think the thing that Novak tries to do is to, that I find valuable at least, is to analyze how our system here in the United States actually works. And he calls that uh, a democratic capitalistic system. And he claims that there's really three elements that comprise that system. One is uh, a political element, which uh, emphasizes uh, democratic procedures, freedom, and so on. And then the economic component, which is largely based on the free market idea. And then what he calls the, the moral dimension, the cultural moral part of our whole society, which would be found in the churches and the press and the universities and so on. And so he tries to describe to us uh, how that system generally uh, works for us. And um, I suppose one of the th his is, He's very positive on the system, of course, and I think one of the things he says is that actually the whole political democratic approach to life is sort of tied to a capitalistic system, that capitalism fosters a sense of democracy and freedom. And um, perhaps we can start out on that uh, level there and see what we make of, of that idea. Well, I think the, the point made in uh, Novak's book is that the institutions of, let's just focus on the political and the economic ones for a okay. moment, the institutions that uh, we think about, the individual businesses, corporations, and so forth, and the, the various legislative, administrative, bureaucratic bodies that make up the political 
uh, element or the political dimension of the society, both in their nature geared to serving larger social ends, but doing it through individual initiatives, uh, much more subsidiarity uh, in that system than tended to be the case in historical systems of feudalism or uh, alternative systems which uh, we know in the world today of socialistic or communistic kinds of systems. And I think he sees the, the, the balance in the individual social realm as being very desirable and that he obviously is trying to take apart a very complicated phenomenon which we call the, the social, political, economic scheme uh, that exists in the United States today and trying to analyze it in a, in a more simplified version. But of course, he's very positive now in a capitalistic system, isn't he? He, he really ends up thinking that that's uh, the best kind of system we have available today, that it fits in best with his notion of human nature, that it's produced the best kind of results that we find in the world, that it's more compatible with the realities of life than the socialist system and that's so right. on. And so he really um, puts a lot of emphasis on uh, the, the values and the functional uh, aspect of this uh, whole capitalistic system. Of course, he goes back here to Adam Smith, I notice a lot. He gets a lot of play in Novak's book. He comes up a lot and with his, whole, his book, The Wealth of Nations, which really came out in 1776, an uh, important date for us, of course, in our own history. And... Uh, try, says that that's sort of the birth of this whole idea that in the Anglo-Saxon world we've had uh, with Adam Smith this idea of celebrating the capitalistic system that is based on the division of labor and on people accumulating wealth and being able to invest it and thereby uh, somehow helping all classes of people in society really to better themselves. So um, <clears throat> maybe we should... Um, talk a little bit about uh, some of those elements that Novak finds in there, about the, the whole free market idea which and the way that that functions. Why don't we talk about that? Well, the, the nature of a free market is, first of all, it's free for the individual institutions or firms um, that operate in that market, that buy and sell in that market. Uh, from the standpoint that Novak or any other philosopher, I suppose, looks at it, uh, you see the notion of competition and profit incentives that seem to promote technical efficiency, that uh, reward people for producing useful products and services, that uh, do the nature of competition. You get... Uh, prices that reflect costs, both direct and opportunity costs, and something, of course, that Adam Smith really didn't uh, see through very well from uh, an 18th century perspective, but we certainly are aware of in the last hundred years or so, and that due to the Industrial Revolution, and that's the technological progress or the innovations in both products and industrial processes that uh, ultimately increase the value or the quality of, of the goods and services that we produce, or lower their costs of production. Now, when you uh, talk about this free market economy, I, I mean, there's one model that one has in mind, sort of a totally open system where supply and demand uh, function, and if there's a need, people will come forward and learn to produce it, and there'll be competition among those who produce a given product, and that will help lower the cost, and all of those kinds of things. But... I'm not sure that our economy really functions that way, does it? In other words, when you start talking about capitalism, you have to see it in, in some sort of historical perspective. As you suggested, it really has changed a great deal from Adam Smith's day to our own day. I notice a lot of authors talk about an early capitalism, a rigid, laissez-faire capitalism, and oppose it to what we have today, which might be a more modern or later capitalistic approach. And, Surely, in today, when we look at our own society, I mean, we find so many things aren't really free. Even our current president, who talks a lot about the free market, then we find uh, proposals like, well, uh, paying farmers not to 
produce uh, particular products. We find industry subsidized in various ways and so on. So I, d I don't think we really have a totally free market, do we? Well, I think you, the question of freedom is a relative one. First of all, even if we pay farmers not to produce, those farmers are still free to produce if they wish. There are just certain risks that they take if they do that. And all that the uh, federal government has done is promise to reward them if they didn't do it because the federal government, through, its, through the political side, is saying that... Uh, the world would be better off or the society would be better off if we had a little less corn or a little less wheat or a little less soybeans or something like that. Uh, freedom, of course, uh, is always constrained in a system where we have interdependence. And I suppose it's fair to say that, that interdependence between people, between groups of people across regions, of the world, of the country, is a good deal greater in 1982 than it was in 1782. Uh, the notion of the self-contained social system just isn't a very practical one today in, in any respect. And, of course, the historical point that I made earlier in terms of the Industrial Revolution, sure, we have much larger enterprises today in terms of employment, in terms of investment, in terms of the, the character of the technology used than was ever envisioned a hundred years ago. But what, what do you do with the kind of situation where you do have these large corporations and where they sort of corner the market or they have a, a lock on the resources in one way or another, one thing to the oil companies or the high technology companies? and. Um, how does uh, that you talk about freedom and you say, well, yeah, theoretically that's a free market system there, but one begins to wonder, well, how free is it really? I mean, suppose somebody wants to start up a opposing business or something uh, to one of the giant corporations. And there's really not much chance of doing that. I mean, I'm not so sure that in any real sense that that, that kind of freedom exists. Yeah, theoretically you're free to do these various things, not to grow crops and so on, but if the government is going to make you such a good deal, then uh, you're not going to grow the crops. Well, you know, the, and there's larger questions then that are raised, like, well, what does that mean in terms of world hunger and so on? But, I mean, I, let's set that one aside for a minute, but uh, how are you going to respond to the point that, that actually freedom doesn't seem to exist in many ways? Well, I think the genius of the system is that there is comparative freedom. You have major corporations that have grown up in the past 20 years in the, uh, in the computer field that didn't even exist uh, 20 years ago. Small companies, Apple, uh, to name one of the classic, but there are others as well, that have, Hewlett Packard, that have become uh, very substantial in terms of the Fortune 100 firms that really didn't exist even 20 years ago, or if you like, uh, uh, perhaps a better example is the Xerox Corporation, which uh, everyone is reasonably familiar with, which in the uh, early 50s was a small company that produced photographic papers in uh, Rochester, New York. Very small company. That, this uh, proves that it's possible for a company to take over a new field, doesn't it? Or that uh, technology opens up new things and somebody grabs hold of it. I was sort of arguing the question about, you know, how powerful the large corporations in the United States become and how much, uh, really, you know, it, it sounds strange to the layman, for example, to hear about Marathon Oil in Finley, Ohio, wanting to have their own company. And here comes uh, two giant conglomerates who fight over them, and, and Marathon has to end up ceding their own autonomy in some way. And that has great um, human factors, it seems. Uh, what ends up happening is that people in Finley are afraid they're going to lose their jobs or have to move someplace, someplace else and so on. So, uh, in other words, that's uh, where it seems to me the realities are. The, the layman in the field reads that kind of thing and says, boy, the corporations are powerful. Uh, they're doing this kind of thing to small people and smaller industries. Where's the freedom for Marathon Oil even to exist as an autonomous unit? 
Well, it's interesting. I don't want to uh, get into a situation where I have to defend the Marathon merger with U.S. Steel, please. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing about that, of course, is that um, it has been argued that Marathon was not as well managed as some other oil companies, and that as a result of that, its share prices were sufficiently attractive to other organizations that they became a takeover. So, uh, in fact, if you're willing to see beyond the obvious uh, problem of what happens to uh, the ABC family in Findlay, Ohio, who may suddenly find themselves under new management, or perhaps out of a job or forced to leave Findlay, the, uh, there still remains a great deal of freedom in the system. Yes, there's no question that uh, uh, power in the system is uh, hardly dispersed evenly among all participants. Uh, certainly a U.S. deal or a mobile uh, has more economic and, I suppose, political power than a marathon, which is still a relatively large corporation. And certainly Marathon is much more powerful than Joe Doe, who runs the Marathon Station at the corner of uh, Smith Street and William Street. But uh, none of these systems are, are perfect. I think that uh, you have to recognize the trade-offs and compromises that that are struck in any organization, that are struck in a family, that are struck mm -hmm. in uh, any political structure. and economic system is no different. And that brings up one of the points that Novak in his book keeps arguing, that book called The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. Uh, his great claim is that uh, this kind of free market economic system uh, really fits in best with human nature, you know, and, and uh, the way that we actually function. And I think he, he sees human nature as very ambivalent, a mixture of good and evil, and uh, that the evil tendencies are there and so on, and that the brilliance of Adam Smith and uh, the ingenuity of the, of the capitalistic system really is that it is, shows how self-interest can somehow benefit the common good. And that's his great claim, that people will act out of self-interest, and in doing so in this economic system, that somehow the common good will be benefited. So some fellow who wants more money for his family and wants a better way of life is going to go out and invest in a little business and that little business then is going to somehow produce a product that other people can use and will benefit the society as a whole and i think that uh, he considers that to be the great contribution i think of the wealth of nations by adam smith that somehow you can turn self-interest into uh, a care for the common good mm -hmm. That really his notion of self-interest is broadened out. He makes the idea that few people act purely out of selfishness, that many people in, the, in our culture, their real care is like for their family, for example. And many people will work hard, long hours, and work two jobs and so on in order to have a little higher standard of living for their family, and that uh, the average person wants a, a good life for a larger group than just to his own self. So that uh, I think that's probably a helpful contribution that Novak makes as well. But anyway, it's one of the prime underpinnings, I think, of his optimistic and positive assessment of our economic system, that it works, that it works because of the checks and balances and the way the free market works. It will turn self-interest to advantage for the larger group, for the common wheel. Sure, I think you can see... Uh in the abstract, at least, the, uh, the contemporary American economic system, a little bit like a boat with four people in it. Uh, in order for the boat to make progress, all have to row. And the, uh, the system rewards the individuals in the boat for how hard they row. And uh, as a consequence, they are inclined to row, as opposed to sitting and leaning on their oars and letting uh, the other people row. And, of course, if... Uh, the argument for other kinds of systems is that there's a tendency to uh, stimulate all f all four people to lean on their oars, and as a result, the boat doesn't make any progress, no rowing gets done. It's an interesting analogy. Did you just make that up now, or is that a 
commonly used one in your field. I suspect it's commonly <laughs> used, but I just made it up. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, it's helpful. Uh, it, it really, it does say, again, what uh, Novak is trying to uh, tell us. And again, I think we're at sort of a descriptive level here, Tom. We're trying to say how the system runs, at least uh, through the eyes of Michael Novak. I, I mean, there's a strong critique of all of this that, I think, has to be mounted somewhere along the line here. But maybe we could spend a little bit longer just trying to see how the system does indeed work. I know that the, the political side has to be brought in here as well, and I think that Novak likes to see the political order as guaranteeing freedom for the economic order, that uh, he thinks the, the freedom uh, is important, of course, to the way the system works. And, in fact, he thinks that freedom, uh, democratic freedom, is tied up in some essential sense with the capitalistic system. And I think that uh, part of his sense is that for the people who argue the economic system is really too strong in a way, he keeps saying how uh, large the political governmental structure is. I think one place I read that he said that the government employed more people than the Fortune 500 companies put together. I don't know if that's uh, correct now, but his point was that the government is a powerful instrument. In fact, he fears, in our own system in the United States now, statism. I suppose that's one reason why he backed Ronald Reagan in the last election, because he felt that the real problem is that the government gains too much control over the, the economic system. And he'll say things like, well, when government puts on regulations, like on the car companies, for example, then they have to comply, that they're not as powerful as they seem. And then we say that, well, the economic uh, conglomerates can advertise and influence us. And he'll say, well, yeah, but they, they counteract one another, and the American public isn't all that dumb. They can see through it and so on. So you know, I guess when he's looking at the balance of this whole thing, his idea is that the political governmental structure that makes up part of this tripartite system we have is too big and too strong, and he wants, rather than the regulation of the corporations, to, in a sense, free them up, feeling that that's going to help the common good. Many people would strongly disagree with that, of course. Well, I, you're you're dealing, again, with a balancing kind of question. I think uh, most thoughtful people, whether in business or academic life or simply sitting at home reading the newspaper, would recognize some need for social regulation of individual enterprise, and the, much the same argument that uh, supports why we have speed limits and red lights, uh, why we have referees in athletic contests, that unfettered freedom often uh, carried out by people who do not have a great deal of responsibility or wisdom uh, leads to some unfortunate results. On the other hand, if that regulation becomes so heavy-handed, um, then the advantages of the freedom are lost. Uh, you you get into a more of a bureaucratic kind of system where there really is little incentive and uh, little opportunity to uh, to do something unique, to do something different. At the same time, and I think much of the argument in the 1980. Uh, a presidential campaign had to do with the total cost of, of this regulation. Cost in terms of, uh, obviously, as I've just mentioned, the, the limitations on the individual. If, if but for regulation, business were free to do something really great, uh, but because of the regulation they're inhibited, they're prohibited from doing it, then that's a cost. That's what we call an opportunity cost. Um, at the same time, the very character of the regulation itself uh, leads to direct cost to the society from the taxation side. You're simply having to pay a lot of people to write a lot of memos and to uh, spend a lot of time uh, checking, looking over people's shoulders and into organizations to see what they're doing or not doing. That's a cost to the society. The society at any given point in time uh, has a, a limited capability to finance services, and there are different kinds of services we want to finance in any society. 
Uh, naturally, we want to balance the amount of regulatory service we get against the, what I suppose we could call the productive service. Tom, let me save just a few minutes uh, to say something about the moral cultural side of this. Is, is speaking out of the church tradition part of that uh, moral cultural element in this whole system? There, there would be a critique mounted. I, I think that out of speaking out of the Christian tradition, we would say, well, does the capitalistic system somehow foster greed? Is it proper that we have such great inequalities in the system? We'd have to try to speak out about the, the unemployment that is rampant. We'd have to try to say, are we caring for the marginalized and the, the down and outs in our society? Are we properly concerned with human dignity and human rights for all segments of our society? We'd have to, to mount a critique, I think, of the capitalistic system and, and not just let it sit there and say, well, there, you know, it's the best there is or it's God's way or somehow the Bible says we have to do it that way. And I think that a voice has to be heard in the culture for a humane element to remind us that people are more important than profits and that corporations have responsibilities to people and uh, can't just displace workers and so on. And that we have somehow the, the, the government uh, has to help these people who are uh, down and out, that we can't just uh, throw away these people as expendable and so on. So I think that um, that voice has to be heard in critique of the, of the capitalistic system as well. I agree, Jim. I think the one, the one weakness of, of Novak's or any other analysis of a system, of course, is that it, <clears throat> it assumes, for argument's sake, that, that the people involved in the economic system or the political system are devoid of moral or cultural elements in their own being. In fact, the people who run business organizations and people who buy products and who are elected and bureaucratize in our governments, if that's a word, uh, are in fact also uh, the inheritors of a culture and carry certain moral values into their work. And they, they too reflect, I suppose, what Novak would say the moral cultural institutions are saying to them. They, in fact, act them out. And uh, perhaps uh, it's a, a useful way to look at it is the moral cultural system, in that realm at least, is the balance wheel of a society. Yeah, so we have a way in theology of saying that, that in a way that religion is the substance of the culture, that it uh, provides the values and so on that are worked out in the culture. So that... Um, well, Tom, we've been uh, trying to look a bit at how our society runs and uh, taking that model of saying that it is based on a political democracy in which we are free and we try to maintain our freedom and expect the government to try to create an atmosphere of freedom and on an economic system that's based on the free market, although from my vantage point at least that free market doesn't seem so free and that there are certain governmental constraints and uh, built-in factors we have to look at. And thirdly, the moral cultural system, which somehow ought to act as the conscience of the whole system. And I think that from my Christian perspective, again, I want to make sure that there is a degree of compassion built in that system and that maybe reforms have to be made to try to make sure that the benefits do come to the poor and the dispossessed. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, campus minister at the University of Toledo. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Dr. Thomas Prime, professor of marketing at the University of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections was the capitalistic system, an analysis and critique. If you have any questions about today's program or have any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mary Beth Kirshner.
Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.